Clock. So welcome everybody to the 24th episode of the Minnesota Outdoor Skills and Stewardship Series. We're going to talk about a little bit about small game hunting today. Just a couple of housekeeping rules. This program will be recorded. So Mr. Kiger will start that here in a few minutes. Uh, if you do have any questions, please feel free to type them in the Q&A section. You'll find that in the lower right hand side there. If you pop the Q&A section up, you can type your questions in there and Amu and I will go try to answer those throughout the program. Um, there's a chat area there. If we have any links that we share, we'll try to put the links in that chat area so you can click on those if you wanna save those for, for future use. So also at the bottom right hand side is the multimedia viewer. So if you want the closed captioning feature, go down there and click on that. It'll take you to an external website where you'll be able to see all the closed captioning for today's talk. So with that, I think we can start the recording and we will start the program. So again, my name is Benji Cohn. I work for Minnesota DNR. I work in the outreach section of Fish and Wildlife. And today I got a friend and colleague that used to work with us in, out, in outreach, Amu Q. And uh, he's, he's new to hunting. And I, I kind of grew up a little bit in uh, Southern Minnesota and small game hunting was a big part of my childhood. My grandpa had a, had a small farm. So I was probably 10 years old or so when I started making a quarter of pigeon to get some of those out of the, the barn and the, the feed area. And, Hunted some at the neighbor's house, and uh, some of those birds turned into my my first and only horror adventure into taxidermy. So it was a learning curve when I was young, and I still like to get out and, and do chase small game now. So with my daughters, and on the screen there, my daughter Lily is out shooting a little bit. So, Mo, why don't you introduce yourself and, and tell a little bit about your hunting background? My name is Mo. I'm working with the DNR uh, right now. Main lesson center. A uh, little bit about my background with the small game hunting. Uh, when I grew up uh, back home, uh, I did I did not do a lot of hunting. But my parent, my especially my dad is one of uh, is the is the biggest hunter. So he will go hunt uh, a lot of you know uh, a lot of time. So he will do that. And uh, when I moved to you know the third country here, and uh, I I I'm I, I was interested in hunting, but I don't have the resources. You know, it was really hard at at first. But uh, as I and uh, as I was learning the language, the culture, and I uh, started to get a little bit, uh, you know, the the knowledge of the rule of regulation. You know, that's when I, that's when I started. But uh, I I'm gonna keep it there, and then I'm gonna share more detail how I get started with that in the in the later. Uh, slide. Great, thanks, Amu. Well, let's just jump right into it here. So, getting started, what do you need to get started in in a hunting small game? So, typically, a firearm is the the uh, method of take that most people choose. Although, I do want to point out that archery is an acceptable form of small game hunting. A lot of people use uh, what they call judo points. It's a three-pronged uh, head on their arrow, and they'll use uh, flufu arrows. They have big feathers on the back. So I've never actually tried that. I've seen a couple people do it, and it looks like a good, challenging, fun thing to do. But I tend to stick with with um, air rifles as kind of my weapon of choice for that. Uh, that Some of the firearms used on the top there is a, is a 20 gauge that my daughter likes to use. I also use a 22, which is a very common uh, firearm to use. And the bottom two are, are uh, 17 caliber air rifles. I'll get into that a little bit later too, but air rifles for me is, is an easier entry point a little bit for, for small game hunting. And I really enjoy them because especially the bottom one, there's a little bit lighter to carry and I could be out there shooting squirrels is one of my favorite things to chase out in the woods and I fire I can get a couple of shots at a squirrel if I miss which is kind of nice because they don't make the loud noise like a 22 does or a 20 gauge to um, 
scare them off. So but anything from a 17 caliber air rifle to a 12 gauge shotgun can be used for small game. Um, air rifles, just a, just a word of warning there. On air rifles, if you go out to your local um, big box store and just pick up the cheapest air rifle you got, it's not gonna be very effective for hunting. So make sure you get one that is gonna be effective for what you wanna do. If you're just shooting, you know, maybe rabbits or up to rabbits and small circles, pins, um, crows maybe, that 17 caliber, if you get a muzzle velocity of 800 feet per second or over is pretty effective. If you get anything bigger than a rabbit, a 22 caliber air rifle that's shooting over 500 feet per second is a pretty effective weapon. So just a word of clarification in Minnesota, the definition I have across the bottom there, the definition of a firearm means any gun that discharges a projectile or shot by means of an explosive, a gas, or compressed air. So remember that even though the purchasing isn't necessarily the same on air rifles as it is for a, a 12 gauge shotgun, carrying them in your car is, it is considered a firearm. So make sure it's always cased and um, stored properly and empty. So do you have anything to add on that, Amu? I just want to add a little bit on the background check and the, the price. So the air rifle is a little bit cheaper compared to the, re, the, the regular firearm. Uh, so if you purchase the, you know, the air rifle, it's going to be a little bit way cheaper than the regular firearm. So, and then uh, the background, when it's come to the background check, for the regular firearm, they will check your background uh, compared to uh, compare that to the air rifle. For the air rifle, I believe you can just go into the store and then uh, you pay for it, and then you can walk out with the with the air rifle, and you can you know you can use it for the small game hunt. Most of the small game uh, small game hunting. And uh, when I first purchased my firearm, uh, I went with Veggie, shout out to him and uh, Jeff too. So they took me to purchase my first firearm. For me, it's very, uh, it's a little different because go to the store and then you have to fill up, you know, application. I have no experience with that. So there is a few questions that I didn't know. So they helped me out there. They explained to me. So we are able to get the application in and then I was able to get, you know, the background in and everything. And everything went well. So I was able to get my first firearm. It is a 20, uh, 20 gauge and I use that for majority of my small game hunting. This whole thing, it's nice, a 20 gauge is kind of a, a one quiver type gun where you can use it for deer hunting with a slug barrel. You can use it for bird hunting, pheasants or something like that, grouse, and then small game hunting also. So anybody using different shot, if you're doing squirrels or something, using a six shot or something like that is fine. And smaller shot, eight shot or something like that for some of the birds is helpful, so. Other items that are going to come in handy for small game hunting. Uh, Blaze Orange, we'll cover this a little bit more as we continue. Uh, but Blaze Orange may be required. It's not necessarily always required. And in certain seasons, more of it is required. We'll talk about that a little bit more. If you look off on the right there, you can see the difference that that makes in being seen. A map and compass or GPS. Uh, usually small game hunting involves a lot of walking, looking around, um, I like to do it a lot in the fall when I'm looking for for deer or for other game that I might be hunting later in the year. It's a good way to get out and scout. Uh, rules and regulations book. Those, and just to point out real quick, we got, those are coming out in multiple languages too. There's one yeah. holding the, the new one up. Uh, Walk-in access pass, we'll cover that in a little bit. A HIP certification, a, a harvest, I can forget the words now. I got, I got it written down in the slideshow here, but certification for migratory birds is could be required. Uh, game cleaning equipment. So I like to, especially for rabbits or small game, I like to carry a knife so I can, when I go out, the, the um, way I clean them, I, I skin them, I'll clip the feet, tail, and uh, heads off and just throw them in a cooler or something. I get back to the car so I can cool them off. but. Fun thing about squirrels, you can, I always try to save the tails. You can sell those to maps or make spinner baits out of them for fishing in the summer. So uh, first aid kit and then firearm safety. Got a nice picture of that down on the bottom there. It's a little different for small game because firearm safety 
in general for 12 and older is required. For small game, it's 13 and over it's required for that. But Amu, did you want to touch on the apprentice validation thing here a little bit? Yes. So let's say uh, if you're over the age of uh, 30 and you have firearm safety yet, you can get something called apprentice uh, validation. That's when you purchase uh, with you know the small game. So you purchase that. Uh, the cost of that is three dollar, and then uh, you have that twice in your lifetime. Let's say if you don't have it, you can use it twice. So you can use it in two year. If you use it this year and next year, then the uh, after that you will have to either complete your your firearm safety or you will not be able to to have, uh, to to purchase a small game anymore. So it good it's good for a two year twice. A, Plus in your lifetime, and then uh, so if you do purchase that, you will have to go with somebody that is already already licensed, that gone through the firearm safety classes. You got to be with them. Uh, for adult, you got to be within you know visual or verbal, within that range. Uh, for the for the children, they have to be within the arm range, so they have to be like very close to the the lancing hunter. So that's the requirement. Uh, I think. That's also based on the age as well. So if you want to know more about the age, uh, let's say if you want to know if you stay, you have to be with it, you know, the arm range. Uh, we we also have the uh, we also have the answer for that. But in general, the children they have to be with it, the arm range, and the adult they can be a little bit further, but they still have to maintain that you know uh, range with the uh, vision or verbal. And it's a great way, especially for people that are thinking about hunting, not really sure, don't have firearm safety. It's a great way to explore it and check it out. And correct me if I'm wrong, Amu, but if you buy, you go for your apprentice validation for this season for small game hunting, you can also use that. It counts as once at one use if you use it for small game and then you decide to try deer hunting and maybe duck hunting or pheasant hunting or something also. It's one uh, apprentice validation will cover yep. this year, this season. So, so if you're thinking about it and want to explore other things besides small game hunting, by all means, if you're getting a hunter or, a, or a apprentice validation, explore as much as you can while you have it. So, right. some of the species you can hunt. Uh, this I actually got off of an, an air rifle or Air Gun Depot, I think was the name of the site. But um, it's pretty cool because it has all the, the uh, species that are legal for air rifles in each state. So all these species are, are small game species in, in Minnesota and they're legal to take with a air rifle. So if you do travel to another state, small game hunt in another state, make sure that you check out their rules and regulations, especially if you're air rifle hunting to make sure that your rifles are are legal for all these species, but so uh, back to regulations. A couple of quick facts: uh, 16 and older have to have a small game license. There's no state or federal migratory waterfall stamp required to hunt woodcock, rail, snipe, or sandhill cranes or morning doves in Minnesota. Um, just a, a good general rule: do not disturb a burrow or a den of any wild animal between November 1st and April 1st. It's a general good rule and it's illegal too. So stay away if you find a den or something, don't go digging around. And a, and a couple of species that people think of kind of as small games, but they're not legal to take with firearm or archery is a pine marten, fisher, mink, and muskrat, beaver, and otter can only be taken by trapping. So just something to be aware of. We had a picture of the new 2021 uh, hunting and trapping regulations here. Um, you, can, you can actually start going now. The 1st of September, snipe rail and crow season opened up in Minnesota. On the 18th here coming up next week, it's, I think next Saturday, right? The rabbit, hare, and squirrel are some of my favorite ones to chase because I like to get my dog out and run around for some squirrels. So in October, it's a little, a little odd because you gotta know where you are in the state. Uh, in the southern part of this, or in the northern part of the state, excuse me, on October 14th is the opening for raccoon and possum, fox, badger, and the southern region the 21st of October. But that's all in the regulations book, and we'll show you where that link is shortly. And all year, 
coyote, skunk, and weasel are open. So they're classified as a as a game species and they're open year round. So and clothing, I told you we get back to the blazed orange a little bit. Um, like I said, in most cases, one article of blaze, blaze orange or pink is required. So if you're out small game hunting, you're required to have a hat that's a blaze pink or blaze orange on. During any of the open firearms or muzzle loader deer seasons, a cap and all outer clothing above the waist has to be blazed orange. So, Emu, what were you saying the other day about your blaze orange? More is better? The more is better. So, for me personally, uh, whenever I go out hunting, I usually use the cap, you know, my hat or my vest, you know, just to be safe, you know. Uh, I rather want, you know, the other hunter to see me uh, instead of, you know, the animal to see me, you know. I, I it, it don't really bother me if the, you know, the squirrel, you know, they see me with the orange blade. I don't really care. <laughs> I'm, I was more, I am more, you know, I am more, more than, you know, like, for other people to see me instead of the animal. So that, uh, I'm just going to put it that way. Uh, for me, that's for me personally. That that's really up, to, you know, up to you and the hunter, you know, that they want to choose. But like Benji said, uh, if it's during the small game season, that is not during the mass loader or firearm season. You can have what article, article is the the blaze ori or the pink. So that's the long. So you, you got to follow that too. Yeah. So from from me personally, that's what I think. The more you have, the better the better it is for your safety. Being, being seen is always good. Yeah. So, except, and there's a couple exceptions here. Um, when there's no firearm or muzzle or deer season open, uh, if you're hunting turkeys, migratory birds, or raccoons or predators, like coyote, fox, and bobcat, you don't have to wear blaze orange. Um, typically, those are stationary hunts that you're on. You're not out walking around. The general rule of, of thumb is, you know, especially turkey hunting or you know, morning doves or duck or something like that. I wear blaze orange out into the field. I take it off once I'm set in my blind and stuff is set up to hunt. And then I can put blaze orange on the way back out. Again, it's just a safety thing for walking in and out of the woods. You don't know who else is out there. So other items to, to remember for clothing, uh, a good pair of shoes, a good base layer that's not cotton. So it wicks moisture away, tick protection, Ticks are out pretty much the whole small game season. So using a permethrin spray or long pants tucked into socks or tick gaiters, um, do the best you can. I always do a tick check when you get home. I personally like to wear pants that I get like a wax coated type pant that I use a lot for like pheasant hunting and stuff that sheds water. So if I'm walking through a lot of damp grass and stuff early in the morning, I don't, I'm not soaking wet all day. So. Anything else on clothing and move? Yeah, this one is uh, is good to go. All right. So back to the lovely minnesotadnr.gov website. We have a ton of information on this website. So I have three things circled over on the side here, and I'm going to go through those in order. So buying a license, hunting and trapping, and maps. So this is just from our general homepage. Again, mndnr.gov. This will it'll bring you here. Popular links in the side. Buy a license, hunting and trapping, and maps. We'll get you to a, a ton of information that's going to be helpful. So we'll start with buying a license. Uh, like we said, you can buy them online or in person. Uh, 16 and over need a license. If you're younger than that, you don't. It's a $5 license for 16 and 17-year-olds. 18 to 64 is 22. Uh, if you're over 65, you get the 1350 license. Talked a little bit about walk-in access. That's a very cool program in Minnesota where you have, um, I forget the acreage now, it's thousands of acres that are private landowners. They make an agreement with the DNR to allow uh, public hunting on that property. So you do have to buy this walk-in ac um, access pass for $3 when you buy your license. And 
You can see the walking access signs that are well marked. Again, it is private property, so please respect that property and clean up after yourself and don't be lighting, lighting fires or, or shooting random stuff out there. It's it's designated for specifically for hunting. So go out there hunting, pick up your shells and, and respect the private property so that we can continue to grow that program, hopefully, so we have more access. Uh, please remember that you do need uh, a pheasant waterfall stamp in the state of Minnesota if you're going to chase uh, waterfall or pheasant. And the HIP certification, the Harvest Information Program. I already got the words out. It is a free thing, but if you're going to hunt uh, migratory birds of any kind, and that includes woodcock, snipe rails, or morning doves, which morning doves are a popular game species, so it is required that you get that. And it pretty much, when you harvest an animal, it you have to fill out a little form that says what you harvested, how many, so they can track how that harvest is going. So. We'll move on to the next thing I had circled there and then a couple slides ago is the hunting and trapping section. I have a couple things circled in here, regulations. Um, this is where you're gonna go to find all your regulations online. You can download that in a PDF form onto your phone if you're gonna bring that with you. Uh, there's paper versions available at most sporting goods stores or ELS uh, licensed vendors. Um, if you do go to that page, there's a link here. You can see this English version. Soon, there's going to be um, four languages available in our hunting and trapping regulations, and Amu's been working on the Karen one. Now that's going to be released here pretty quick. So if your friends and family have um, English as a second language, we may have the your first language available there. So it's, it's pretty cool. Minnesota, I think, is the first state to translate, at least in those four languages, some of their hunting regulations, which is pretty cool. So. Uh, just general hunt information, small game take here in places. We got to find out where to go, right? So, so it's, just, it's another area to access this next slide that we're talking about is maps. So we have, we're pretty heavy on data at the DNR. We like to make maps and collect data, right? So if you go to the mapping page, there's a ton of maps, everything from hydrology to GIS, farmland surveys and everything else. So Go down here to the select thing and click on hunting. And that's gonna bring you a list of all these places to check out. So, um, Amu, do you have any favorite places to go small game hunting? Yes. So when I first started, uh, I just wanna share my little experience with, you know, with uh, how I started uh, small game. So the past two years, so that's when I started. Uh, I go with Badgy. So he took me to uh, his parent place down south. Uh, this somewhere in Red Wing. So we uh, he took us there. Uh, I had a couple of friends that go with me uh, too. So that's when I start hunting uh, for for the small game. So shout out to him. You know he took me uh, for for my first time going small game hunting. That was very uh, excited and I'm I'm very happy. You know uh, I'm, I'm very happy to go. To, to go with him so so my so I also learned from that as well so I, so when you first started I think it is it is the best if you go with somebody that you know they already know the rule and regulation they know where you know where to go so that's the best play, you know the best thing to you know to do when you first started so having somebody that you know they can mentor you uh, you know that's the best way to learn and the best way to get involved in hunting and uh, the other thing I learned is that you know, if you if you are a big hunter, and if you you know if you would like to take somebody there, you know, to, just to show them you know how to do stuff, uh, how to do small game hunting, that would be great. You know, for for the either the younger generation or people that does not know how to hunt, uh, if it's their first time to go hunt. So I'm um, I'm pretty sure they would be happy, very happy, and they will be very appreciative of that. And uh, I also. Also, want to share some of my uh, hunting, small game hunting. So whenever I I go hunt, I never go alone. I will either went with my a couple of my a body, and I also bring a uh, new people, new hunter with me. So sometimes they have they have you know a small game license, but sometimes they don't. They just want to go out there just to explore, you know, uh, 
I bring them with me because I want to show them, you know, we the state of Minnesota here, we we have a really good uh, natural resources that we can use, you know. So I just bring them with me uh, just to, you know, for them to explore. Uh, and the majority of them, you know, they, they fall in love with it. They started, you know, taking the class, you know, doing, you know, uh, some of the, they, they do online classes, they complete it, you know, and then the next time, they, you know, they already go hunting. So I think, you know, going with somebody that, you know, new, it will be uh, very helpful and beneficial for the, the new hunter. And then um, that's, uh, that's what I learned from my first experience. And that since then, I do small gate every year. Uh, I never missed it, you know, I went every year. So I'm still, you know, I'm still very happy to, to do that. Sometimes when you go a small game, you know, you might not see anything. It's just, you know, it's just part of, you know, hunt, hunting. Uh, I think if, even though you don't see anything, as long as you have fun in the, you know, in, in, in your hunting trip, you know, and you are be safe, you know, that's the most, uh, that's the most, I uh, think, uh, you know, uh, you know, solution, you know, even though you don't get anything, you still get outdoor, you know, you explore the, the nature and uh, that's sometimes that happened to me too. I, I don't get anything, but I'm still, I still enjoy my hunting trip. So that is, uh, just be safe, you know, uh, have everything you need is, uh, is, uh, the, it is the, you know, it is how you enjoy hunting. So, so keep, keep uh, keep that in, in mind when you go hunt. I think and one of my uh, favorite things when I started working for the DNR and met a moo, and we started doing firearm safety classes together. And then, uh, you know, going through firearm safety and, and learning all the new rules and regulations from from America and from Minnesota specifically, it, I thought it was it was really cool to bring. I think there was four of you on that first yeah. hunt down to my my folks's place, and we went over to a neighbor's uh, farm and and went through asking permission to get on his property and and hunt there, which is a great experience. I mean, a lot of farmers are more than willing to let people on it to hunt small game. Um, and if I remember correct, Amu, he said, "Well, you guys can come out now, but." I don't want you here much longer into October because I, I deer hunt. He deer, he's a big deer hunter, so he doesn't want to scare the deer away. So, right. But we did go down right down the road from my folks' place and went to a wildlife management area and kind of showed that and where you can find the maps for that. So, wildlife management areas are great areas to check out too. It is. We so, state forest. You know, you go up north and hunt state forest land quite a bit too, right? Yeah. So, I do hunt state forest a little bit. But I'm more, I feel more comfortable using, you know, uh, WMA, Wildlife Management Area, because, you know, they have their own separate area compared to that to State yeah. Forest, you know, some other places, you know, in the State Forest, there is some private, you know, property there. <laughs> so it's very, you know, it's a little bit complicated, but I think WMA is, is the best, you know. I have there, you know, every year, so it is good public hunting place for a small game as well. A little, little smaller areas typically too, so. Yep. And scientific natural areas are, are great. Um, aquatic management areas, just uh, heads up on those. Most of those aquatic management areas all require non-toxic shot. So I personally use non-toxic shot when I'm hunting anyway, so it doesn't really affect me if I'm only carrying non-toxic. So, But if you do hunt with lead shot for, for squirrels or something and you stop by an aquatic management area, you got to make sure that you leave all those lead shot shells at home and only bring your non-toxic stuff. So there's some local areas. I know and when I used to live down by Northfield, there's a local county park where they would let us in and, and hunt turkeys on occasion to help with some of the population control. Up in northern Minnesota, we have, do have some great hunter walking trails for specifically for grouse, which are a lot of fun. And then again, we are walking access. So all those maps and locations, all that is located on the mapping page for the DNR. And also if you go to the recreational compass and search that, you can find a lot of that too. So I think that's all we had for slides. So there's some, our contact information, if you have any questions or anything, um, you know, I had a great time taking Amu and his friends out small game hunting. And I learned a little bit about in your culture, how you prepare some of that wild game. I thought that was cool. And, I was a little nervous when you, I think you brought some for lunch one day and you like spicy food, so I decided not to try it. But one of these days, 
we'll have to have a we'll have to have a little cookout. You can cook some some uh, squirrel and porcupine and whatever game we can find and cook out because I want to try some of your recipes. But you said your dad's got a good one. Yeah. <laughs> yep. My so for the uh, smallest species, my favorite is you know uh, squirrel and porcupine. Those are the only two uh, small game species that uh, you know I go after. So it is fun to do a small game hunting. So yeah. So can you answer any questions or anything? And so we head for for a slideshow. So you got any questions out there? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Um... Yeah, we've got some, we've got a couple of questions. Can you review some specific techniques for harvesting squirrels? We talked about that a little bit when we were out of moon. There's kind of the, the train of thought. I like to, I like to go out, find where some squirrels are and then sit down and just hang out and wait for them to kind of come back. Cause they usually scatter. I, um, that's one of the things I like about using an air rifle too is I can usually get a shot or two off before they scatter and then wait for a couple more to come back. And when we were out hunting with the four of us, we kind of almost like a drive, we kind of spaced out and just walked through and just you'd scare squirrels up in the tree and whoever was closest, we'd let take a shot at that. So what do you prefer for, for when you're out hunting a moo? Me personally, uh... I usually it's like you know keep walking you know you look for you know the, the, the square and sometimes that works sometimes that doesn't work you know because as you walk you know the square already hear you you know they they, they just run so <laughs> you know sometimes that work you know sometimes that doesn't work so I think like Beji said you know if you can sit still usually they will they will come back so I think the other technique is you know maybe five uh, four sources you know where you can sit there, just wait for it, you know, if you be very quiet, they will return because they, they need the food, you know, uh, they, that's that, you know, for me personally, I just, you know, I just keep walking, you know. <laughs> you like to explore. Yeah. I think I was just going to say that too, the food source, um, you know, I like, I have a, some property that I hunt that has uh, black walnut trees in there that somebody planted, I don't know, a few dozen of them. But if you can get in the black walnut trees and just kind of hang out and just wait for the squirrels that are coming in and picking those things up and and running, like you you can sit there all day and have multiple squirrels come in, which is kind of fun. Same with with acorn trees. So finding those those food sources and just kind of hanging out for that. Um, rabbits is another really fun one. If you can, you know, even if you're you're walking out on a field rather than being in the field to walk around the fence line and try to scare rabbits out of the fence line and stuff too is is great with an air rifle i'm usually sitting along a fence line waiting for them to come out so i can get a good shot at them because i have if i don't have a shotgun with i can't shoot a running rabbit so i'm not quite that good but excellent <clears throat> uh those are great great tips uh so our next question is what uh what should people be on the lookout for when purchasing non-toxic shot? Um, and then they ask recommended brands, but we don't really recommend brands here. Um, but we can, you know, if, if y'all wanna talk a little bit about the uh, the materials that are used in that non-toxic shot so that people can can be on the lookout for it. Yeah, just for brands, anything you can find these days, it seems like. Um, I, prefer the, I prefer copper ammo. Um, for turkey and stuff, they make, I forget who even makes it. It's called like heavy shot though. Um, I'm not for sure. Is that bismuth? Is that what it's made out of James? You probably know it's, better than I do. Yeah. It's a tungsten bismuth alloy. So yeah, they, um, they, that, that is, a, that is, uh, that's out there. That's been, been pretty effective for me. And, um, unfortunately when I'm with an air rifle, on that, I usually, most of my, my pellets there that I buy, I don't find copper too often in that. So they're just the simple little lead pellets. Um, but I'm just shooting one of them and trying to go for a, for a good 
headshot and most of the time which i'm not eating anyway so that's you know, if i can use non-toxic i do but in that it's and craig might not even know i'm not for sure if we can even buy like a 17 caliber air rifle pellet now you know, i bought probably 1500 of them last time i was in the store and haven't run out yet so i haven't been looking the last couple of years yeah, I haven't been looking for any recently either, Benny, Benji. Um, but we did find some uh, non-toxic uh, air rifle rounds when we were looking a while back. So there were some out there at one time. Yeah, there's 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 quite a few options for non-toxic stuff. Um, if you just do a search for hunting with non-lead, um, you'll find, uh, you know, the first couple of results will be um, some tremendous resources. Um, California requires hunting with non-lead, and so they have a pretty comprehensive list of manufacturers that are out there that, that, that make this stuff um, that meet their standards. So if, if the non-toxic is the way you want to go, there are resources that are out there. You know, I know there, I, I hunt um, squirrels with 22 uh, non-lead it's a it's basically copper dust and a really strong glue that they shape into um, hollow point rounds for 22 rifles um, but there, there's there's options out there steel is a very inexpensive and effective material for using for small game um, that um, you know frequently it's used for waterfowl because it's required to have non-lead for waterfowl uh, on federal lands but um, you know you can use it for other small game too it'll it'll take out a squirrel or a morning dove or a grouse just as just as effectively you just have to have to practice with it because it 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 flies a little different than lead um bismuth is a little uh, more expensive than steel but not the most expensive um and bismuth is good if you've inherited an old shotgun um shotguns made craig help me out made before what the 70s the 80s Yeah, that'd be a pretty close time period. Yeah, so if you if you've inherited an old gun, um, you probably don't want to use steel in it because the barrel isn't going to it's not going to fail on you, but it, you might damage the barrel. It might you might get a bulge at the base of the barrel from shooting steel in an old gun. Bismuth won't do that. So if you've got an like my old 16 gauge which was made in the 30s when i'm hunting non-toxic with it i use bismuth because the bismuth isn't going to damage the barrel um so that's an option and then as there's there's always new materials that are coming out but right now kind of the really pricey stuff is tungsten loads and typically those are reserved for um turkey hunting um or other other shots that you're taking that aren't you're not taking a lot of them because i mean they're some of those tungsten loads can be 10 bucks a, a shell, 10 to 12 bucks a yeah. shell, depending on, on the, the, how they're loaded and, and how big they are and how much tungsten is in them. So there are a lot of options. There are a lot of materials. And every year there are more people manufacturing this stuff. So the damage that you were talking about, James, it's the constriction in the barrel where the choke is at and um, the steel BBs don't deform as they go through that choke tube, and that's where the ring will usually appear is right where the choke tube forcing cone starts. Um, you know, getting a barrel with interchangeable choke tubes on it might put some more life into an older gun, and and then shooting a more open choke, uh, a modified instead of a full, you know, for duck hunting. Yep. Thank All you. Right. Guys. Yeah. Of Either course. way, on ammo. It's uh, start looking now and probably order it online. That's the best best luck I've had when I've needed some stuff. So absolutely it, find it online. Um, another, another question, are there any, whoa, computer, are there better times during the day to be hunting squirrels or rabbits? Amu, you want to take that one? Sure. So morning, uh, they that's when they are the most active. You know, they look for food, and that toward the evening too, like around three at that time. You know, some you know, sometimes you just don't know. 
<laughs> you know, you just go there, you know, hope that you have a good luck with it, you know. But sometimes they like during the morning and then like afternoon around two, three, that's when they are the most active. They try to look for food food. So that's I think that's that's the probably the, the time that I think is it is the best. But you know, it could be different as well too, you know, depending on where you go, you know, how uh, you know, how often you hunt. Because when I hunt, you know, that's usually I go throughout the whole day. So it's including morning, you know, noon, afternoon, everything. So and, and typically most of your small game species are actively feeding most of the day. So your your birds, your squirrels, uh, rabbits, you probably have better chance of seeing them in the quiet morning hours or dusk hours. But you you, you have potential to see them all day long. So it kind of depends on what your schedule is and and how you can get out if you're exploring new areas like both the moon I like to do if you're you know drive to one to hunt the morning and like well let's go try one for the afternoon and explore another area and, and one of the other things I like about exploring new areas and small game hunting too is is looking around for uh, some wild edibles and whatnot and James did a great program in the spring on foraging that's the recordings available on our website now um, we might have to do another one for the fall so I've been seeing a lot of mushrooms and puffballs out there and stuff lately. So getting a little late in the year now, but yeah, there's there's a there's quite a bit coming up. Um, let me see. Uh, here's a question: Are there any opportunities to join someone on a small game hunt? Any suggestions, guys? Oh, how to just ask ask around, ask uh, families, friends. Um, even going out to some of the, you know, uh, state forest areas for, for just a hike. If you run into somebody that's, that's out there and just be inquisitive, say, Hey, well, what are you hunting for? How do you get into it? You know, a lot of people, you know, I've run into people at a, a place over by Stillwater where I go out and do a little squirrel hunting in an oak grove there. Um, if people are interested, I always welcome, welcome them to come along and, you know, even if they're not hunting, if they just want to walk and see what it's like and um, try to get a little squirrel call, it sometimes you get some mad squirrels to call back at. Um, especially for the kids, it makes it fun. But and at, ask around, be inquisitive. There's there's more people that do it, I think, than, than a lot of people realize. Unfortunately, small game has been probably one of the fastest declining. Um, forms of hunting or licensed sales, I guess, in the last however many years, five, 10, 15 years. It, I think it used to be one of the more popular ones and it's just kind of gone downhill pretty sharp here, at least, at least since I was younger. So, but, and it's unfortunate because I think it's a, it's a great way to get out. And I was talking to somebody the other day about getting out and running my dog and exercising the dog and getting my legs back ready for for pheasant hunting and stuff, it's a great way to get out a little bit earlier in the season, uh, still chase some game. Um, rabbit stew is one of my favorite things in the world. And squirrels taste like chicken, so you can't go wrong with that. Um, you know, even on camping trips, if we can stop by a um, WMA or some state land and, and get a couple squirrels to roast over the fire, is that's that's a good day right there. So, um, absolutely. And, and yeah, it's, you know, being out there, the, for me, one of the really nice things about small game hunting is that you can do other stuff. Like you said, you can forage, you can look and see, you know, um, what, what else is out there. Um, it's also a great time to be scouting for deer season, you know, finding like yep. squirrels love acorns, deer love acorns. If you find a really good, if you find some good squirrel woods, you've probably found some good deer woods as well. So Keep an eye out for the bigger trails, the bigger sign. And as the season progresses, keep a lookout for things like scrapes and rubs. And, and um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great way to combine uh, a lot of activities so that, you, you know, you're, you're ticking a lot of boxes when you're out there because there's a lot of opportunities to, to just take advantage of. I'm, sh I'm sure you've never done that like me. I was out walking in the woods and small game hunting, James, and find a place to go and I'm going to mark this spot because I want to come back here, put a great deer stand or a good yep. turkey spot. 
Yep, I, I frequently squirrel hunting. I find my best, um, I use a climbing deer stand when I archery hunt and I'm constantly looking at trees when I'm squirrel hunting. So I'm, you know, I'm, there's, there's some great trees I found that I probably wouldn't have found because I was, I was chasing squirrels. And so, yeah, it's, yeah, you definitely, you mark, you mark trees, you mark trails, you mark water sources, you mark funnel points and all of that's because you're running around chasing, chasing squirrels. So it's, it's a, or, or whatever that's out there. So it's, it's a great time to be out there. Um, we got one last question and Craig, you might need to weigh in on this one as well. You're our, you're our gun guru, but um, the question is, is high brass non-toxic? It can be. Um, <laughs> high brass refers to usually a higher powered shotgun shell. So you could get high brass in lead, you could get high brass in business, you could get high brass in non-toxic loads like steel as well. So you got to look on the packaging to see what they put in there. Um, and usually your higher base brass loads are for waterfall hunting, um, maybe pheasants on a real windy day, uh, you'd want a little bit more power behind that shot column. Good answer, good answer. Um, yeah, I think, so that's all the questions we have in the Q&A. If you gentlemen wanna have anything else to say, Go for I was it. just gonna I was just gonna add and one of the things I find interesting in you know back when I was younger going out squirrel hunting was kind of a solitary deal I go to get away from having to do chores or my sister you know go out squirrel hunting for a little bit and now now that I have kids it's a great way to go spend time with my kids and you know after meeting a moo and, and his buddies it's really renews my interest in going out with with other people and new people too it's a great way to to meet people and experience something different and and learn too which is is awesome it's one of those cool things about about hunting where you don't have to you're not sitting in a tree stand trying to be super quiet and, and stuff you can carry on a little bit of conversation and and do that so yeah. it is i know we'll move from a couple times we've been out and stuff it's you always have a couple of buddies with you and you, you said you don't like going alone. So it's more of a social event too for you, right? Yes, it is. So when I, whenever I go out, I go with, you know, other people as well, you know, just socially, you know, and just, you know, I think it's one of the, you know, it's, yeah, it's a little bit safe, you know, let's say if you get injured, like you, you fall, maybe you trip, you know, it could be any, anything, you know, and if you have somebody there with you, you know, is they can help you out, you know. Uh, you can do you can do the same if something happened to them too. So I think it is like socially and at the same time, you know, like just go out there, you know, uh, you know, they're there with you, they can help you out as well. So nice. We we did have one more question pop in really quick, Benji. Can you yeah. remind folks what the the what are the requirements for air rifles for small game, the caliber and the and the feet per second? Air rifles you can get in all kinds of calibers. Craig could probably list them off, but every, anywhere from 17 gauge up to um, big game hunting calibers. But I I shoot 17 caliber almost exclusively, uh, frankly, because I don't have a 22 air rifle. I got a 22 rifle. But um, if you're out shopping for one, a 17 caliber uh, air rifle, they recommend 1,800 feet per second or over. For that, I think the one I got is runs about a thousand. Um, for a twenty-two caliber air rifle, which I'm looking at getting if I could find one, a little bit nicer if you're if you're going after raccoon or something a little larger like that. Um, they recommend over five hundred feet per second. So, and if you you know you go, my my fear is always it, it is an easy purchase to go. Oh, somebody said something I can go out small game hunting with an air rifle, and they go to Walmart and they buy the little red rider. BB gun that you just see in the old movies and it shoots like 200 feet per second and you know you'll it'll bounce off a squirrel's butt and you know, can't figure out why you, you're missing it all the time and you're not missing it it's just not strong enough to to do damage like you need it to do so so make sure you're you're getting one that's capable and a lot of times right right on the box it'll say 
um, it'll have a picture of a squirrel or a rabbit on there or something like that to indicate that it's a, a higher power, higher power um, firearm air rifle that, that you can use for small games, so. Excellent. Good answer, Benji. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all our questions, and we're coming up on the, the end of the hour. So thanks, Great. Benji and Amu, and I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to you all for the last words. Yeah, if, um, if anybody's around, send Amu and Raya a message. I always like getting out small game hunting, so I'd be happy to take somebody along. Um, obviously, you know, look around and, and find other friends that, that do that too. There's there's actually a really cool um, air, air rifle enthusiast group on Facebook that talks about all things hunting with and target practice with air rifle, which is kind of fun. So search some of that stuff out. It's a great way to get out in the woods. Um, just to kick back and relax a little bit and explore some new areas. Um, you know, get it, like you said, get out, look for some mushrooms, maybe look for a, a turkey spot for the spring or whatnot, uh, share something with some new people. So find something new to take with you or, or find somebody, if you're new, find somebody that has a good spot to go and some tips and uh, see if they would mind letting you join them. So anything else, Amu? Uh, I think that's it, you know. Uh, just, you know, be safe, you know, that's the, the, the main goal, you know, enjoy the, you know, the hunting, you know, like Benji said, you know, if you're new, uh, if you could look for somebody that, you know, they already been hunting, you know, that will work too, you know, go with somebody, like, like I mentioned before, go with somebody that already know what to do, it's all the way, you know, a starting point, you know, that would be a good start, and then uh, if you, if you want to go out hunt alone, you can too. But just, you know, do a research, you know, if you have a question, give us a call, you know, the DR call, and then uh, well, we will answer, we will answer your question as best as we can, you know. So do research, you know, if you do design, go out to do small game alone, you know. Uh, it's, at first, it's going to be a little bit, you know, challenging, but as you go, keep going, you know, you will start picking up, you know, as you, as you go, so. Small game hunting is great because it has it provides lots of opportunities, I think, so which is great. So it's not a not like sitting in the deer woods and not seeing anything for a week or seeing just does when you got a buck tag or something like that. Or squirrel hunting, rabbit hunting, there's there's a lot of critters out there and um it's just finding the right locations and a lot of that comes with experience and and searching. So hope you enjoyed it today. Amu, thank you so much for for uh, coming and helping out with this. I really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully we can do it again soon. Yeah, thank you. Maybe next weekend we go hunting, so. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks everyone.